Diana Getz is an American poet, oh, author of eight collections, including In America, Nameless Boy and the Job of Being Everyone, Everybody, which won the 2004 Cleveland State University Poetry Center Open Competition. Her poems have appeared in many magazines and anthologies, including The New Yorker, Poetry, The Gettysburg Review, The Iowa Review, Plowshares, Southern Review, and Best American Poetry. She's also a nonfiction writer, and she started this um, memoir in Life in Transition blog at The American Scholar. Her memoir, This Body I Wore, was just published by FSG, after being listed as one of the most anticipated books by Lit Hub, CNN, and Glamour, a best book of the year at Cosmopolitan, and a must read of the season by the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, the Bay Area Reporter. Her honors include fellowships from the NEA, NYFA, and a Pushcart Prize. She was born in Brooklyn and grew up in Northport, Long Island. She attended Wesleyan University, NYU, and Vermont College of Fine Arts. For 21 years, she was a New York City public school teacher at Stuyvesant High School, where she taught gifted and mostly immigrant children. Um, you will hear all of the amazing things um, about, about this book, um, and you will hear Diana read from it. But just a couple of things that I want to mention. Um, if you haven't heard her on Fresh Air, uh, was interviewed by Terry Gross, please do so. It's an amazing interview. Ellen Bass, the poet says, clear, thoughtful, and deeply moving. This body I wore is an affirmation to anyone who has struggled to live an authentic life. Indeed, the price of authenticity is an important topic in this book. In her recent interview with Terry Gross on Fresh Air, she told Gross, one of these Tibetan gurus had said, you don't really find out about yourself until you're cornered. But even more apropos, there's a trans man I heard speaking. It was while I was writing this book. And he said that his transition was a death gift to himself, you know, and I related to that. I had already written the program the prologue to this book, where it's presented as a death gift. So I thought this was a really interesting connection between um, Theo and Diana. Please help me welcome Diana. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you for that, Theo. And hello out there in internet land. There's some kind of box over my face. Does that need to be clicked or is that all okay? They can't see that. Oh, okay, that's fine. As long as I don't have to look at my own face. This is a little like the background for hitter, hitters get at ballparks. It has to be green or something. Um, the, you know, listening to Theo and you know, thinking about coming up after him, I actually thought uh, for a moment of um, a book by um, the great um, religion scholar, um, uh, Joseph, help me here, yeah. Joseph Campbell. And he, in one of his great books, I think it might've been Occidental Mythology, he had these two chapters right against each other. And one was the outer journey. And he, he talked about the moonwalk and uh, what that meant mythologically. Um, you know, and, you know, people on the moon when we went there and what, what happened spiritually when that happened. And then the next chapter was the inner journey and uh, it was schizophrenia and the mythological properties of what happened, you know, in, in a more interior journey. And um, I feel like, you know, we kind of hear a moonwalk, <laughs> you know, a very um, dramatic uh, journey that if you were to you know make a movie there would be so much to see and in a way this is the uh the inner journey um this is um you know this is me being blindfolded for most of my life and in fact that's the question that's at the heart of this um book is how can you uh how can you live face to face with an essential fact about yourself and still not see it um 
So at the beginning, uh, at the very beginning of the book, there's a disclaimer about language, with all, which I'll just say briefly. I use the language authentic to each uh, each era uh, and each experience. So um, those who are queer and trans and allies, you know, it's, it, there could be a trigger warning here because I'm going to just use the language at the time. And what I thought I would do is read from this first section where I have plunged into um, this um, underground subculture of cross-dressing in New York City, not finding it one bit unusual because it's just your life. It's just your life, you just do it. I only found it unusual when I thought about this later, like now, it's like, that was really weird. <laughs> it's like, we should write about this because we're gonna, this history will fade. And in the middle of this, there's this chapter called Stuyvesant, where I introduce for the first time that I'm this teacher, this high school teacher during this whole thing. And, um, and but in the middle of this chapter, we go back and forth to these different worlds. I was kind of drifting alone between in New York City. And th so I was gonna read a 10 page section from this chapter. And this sort of describes what I do after school. After school, I often took a ballet or jazz class on Broadway with renowned teachers such as Finus Young, Ronnie DeMarco, or Douglas Wassell. A cast member from Cats used Douglas's four o'clock ballet class as his pre-show warm-up. He'd take bar with us, reel off a few quintuple pirouettes, then stroll across the street to the Winter Garden Theater. In the elevator to the Broadway Dance Center, someone had graffitied a note, advice to fags, don't look for a home in the theater. I'd never quite understood that message. Was it bigotry or was it tough love from one gay man to another? Personally, I wasn't looking for a home in the theater, nor was I a fag. I'd performed in some small companies and took class seriously, though mostly I danced to stay in shape. I also loved being around ballerinas, their strange and magnificent bodies, flexible and fluid, pointing their toes like bird claws. I noticed everything about them. This one wore tights under her leotard. That one wore them on the outside and folded the waistband down onto her hips. This one rolled them halfway up her calves. After class, they flopped on the floor in the hall, gossiping with one another. Some let their hair unravel spectacularly or removed their shoes, revealing battered, chewed up toes, wholly incongruous with their porcelain faces. Just a few moments to rest and socialize, then they were up and gone. I might have been the only one in those classes not waiting tables between rehearsals or auditions. Every so often I'd wander into Times Square porn shops to check on their selection of transgender magazines. These magazines were usually laid out in a few dedicated stacks on tables beside other stacks dedicated to every conceivable proclivity, straight, gay, black, Asian, fat, shaved, hairy, in uniform, tied up, urinating, etc. The T magazines had their own fairly wide range from triple X shemale porn, transsexual climax, shemales in heat, hung TV, to naked posing, lay girls, boys will be girls, to single issue story porn, girl by night, she's a he. Less raunchy magazines such as Les Femmes focused on models and performers. My favorite of these was FMI, Female Mimics International, which dubbed itself, quote, a fantastic magazine for all the sisters out there who enjoy dressing as women to those who hope one day to actually become a real woman through hormones and surgery, end quote. It featured incredibly beautiful transsexuals on the cover, articles on transvestite world capitals and photo spreads of female impersonators on stage or half naked in their dressing rooms or signing autographs in a doorway. Several magazines published feminization fantasy tales. 
quote, her femme nephew had loved the feel and smell of satin and lace, and she felt it her duty to open his eyes to the fact he was different from the rest of the boys. Others mixed in some journalism. On Fom reviewed books on people who transitioned and reported on efforts to change marriage laws in various countries. Tapestry and Transvestia were tamer magazines geared toward more conservative and closeted readers. They presented older transvestites in high-necked dresses and lace and pearls and gave tips on posture and walking, breast forms and beard cover. They were like the ladies' home journals of cross-dressing, and yet I needed to go to a porn store on 42nd Street to find them. Most of these magazines didn't belong in a porn store. Along the side or back of the stores was a wall of peep show boots where men jacked off to videos or to live performers behind glass. Every few minutes I could hear a woman moan or say, yeah, baby, or stroke it. There, were always, there was always a guy mopping, not just the floors of the boots, but the whole store. The mop smelled of a sweet, slightly sickening disinfectant that, even though it was supposed to wipe away semen, might as well have been another kind of semen. <laughs> and there was always a guy behind a register near the door, reminding you to hold the magazines in both hands. He didn't care if you looked through them as long as you didn't bend back the covers. Being forced to hold these magazines in both hands, like prayer books, exposed each customer's turn-ons all the more to the others, though none of us ever spoke. There was a feeling of vulnerability and shame about the place, like the shame on the faces of dogs shitting in public. I usually purchased one or two of the magazines to add to my stack at home. The guy at the register slipped them into a brown paper wrapper and scotch taped it closed, and I shoved it deep into my school bag. Once home, I would spend countless hours between the covers of what I bought, drinking in images, memorizing facial expressions, hairdos, outfits, the length of their nails, the shapes of their lips and smiles, stances and postures. The posed photos and the candid shots, the passable girls living full time interested me most, the lady boys with sad wide eyes on the streets of Bangkok, glamorous transsexuals in their Miami beach of, or San Francisco apartment or whatever place they rented for the photo shoot. There was a black and white photo spread of the legendary showgirl Bambi that I could never get over. She was completely passable, thin and blonde, wearing a full slip and ungartered nylons, leaning into her dressing room mirror or bending forward in the bathtub while smiling sidelong at the camera, the point of a small breast brushing the surface of the water or on a Paris street in a trench coat and kitten heels talking with two other women or bending to greet a small dog on a leash. There were features on classic female impersonators such as Danny LaRue and Craig Russell conjuring fantasies of what it would be like to have a career dressed as a woman. I read about Le Ballet Trocadero de Monte Carlo, the drag ballerina troupe. I read about drag cabarets in their heydays in Amsterdam, London, Berlin, New Orleans, Le Carousel in Paris, Finocchio's in San Francisco, the Jewel Box Review in in Miami. Depending on the publication, the people in them were called T-girls, transvestites, she-males, trannies, impressionists, vixens, temptresses, femme fatales, or pageant queens. Also depending on the publication, the people in them referred to themselves as TV, TS, CD, transgenderist, closet queen, my other half, gal, girl, special girl, girl with something extra, or lady. The one word I never saw used, woman. There were occasional articles purporting to explain the growing transgender phenomenon, the preference the preface to a pinup magazine declared transsexuals to be psychosexual anomalies who must take the lonely but only road that has ever existed for them. 
An unnamed armchair historian in Lay Girls ascribed the explosion in, quote, transvestitic inclinations to changing gender roles brought about by the sexual revolution. Another called transgenderism a bizarre evolutionary leap. I perused these brief, shoddy, typically unsigned articles, then turned right back to the photos and dreamed and touched myself. So it was pretty primitive. I was going to therapy for depression, lying on Dr. Katz's couch for 40 minutes every Monday. I sensed exactly when she'd end each session because high school classes were also 40 minutes. When I first came to her office, I told her I was a basket case and needed to lie down for the full treatment, as though ordering a burger with everything on it. Maybe she was indulging me, or maybe she thought I was only capable of facing a ceiling. Dr. Katz was an older woman, short, bespectacled, and formal. The only time I used her first name, Edith, was on the payment checks at the end of each month. When referring to my cross-dressing, she used the terms ladies' garments and attire, which made women's clothes seem clinical, like car parts, and not the supercharged talismans I experienced them to be. Dr. Katz had trained at the Psychoanalytic Institute, and I was familiar with the Freudian take on, quote, object fetishes, which are regarded as perversions from appropriate erotic objects. Not that we ever discuss psychological theories. Is that what, they, is that what the book says? She shot back the one time I tried. But Freud's view of fetishes rang somewhat true for me. Wearing women's clothes carried a sexual charge that seemed to be fueled by transgression and shame. I projected those feelings onto gorgeously dressed women, no shortage of them in New York, as though their own clothes and appearance were an electric current of sexual pleasure, but also a minefield of shame, the shame of lipstick, the shame of skirts and stockings, shame of heels and bras and panties. I marveled at the boldness of their presentation, the way a junior high bully might grudgingly admire the courage of a flamingly effeminate boy. There was a glamorous short-haired woman I saw a couple mornings each week on the subway to work. We both boarded the front of the train at Court Street. She favored tailored skirt suits, sheer hose, classic pumps, deep red lipstick, and stud earrings. Often I'd see her doing the New York Times crossword puzzle in pen. I wondered where she got the discipline to ignore her magnificent hand holding the pen, her slender fingers and bright red nails to focus on a clue asking for a river in Central Asia. I had my puzzle and she had hers. Then she stepped off at Wall Street to figure out the New York Stock Exchange. I knew that I viewed women through a completely fucked up lens. Yet knowing this did not affect that view. It was like having two selves, the reasonable self that insisted, you're a man, don't complain, was unable to get through to the wild self that kept flying out of my body to inhabit passing women. And possibly there was a third self to eroticize the whole situation, a voyeuristic self that was as wretched as the naked half mass as the half naked masturbators at the vault, which was an SM club. When the papers reported the suicide of a fashion model who threw herself off an Upper West Side balcony, it confounded me. Why would a beautiful woman ever do that? Whatever her problems were, I would have changed places with her in a heartbeat. I fantasized a scenario where I'd rush into her apartment in time to save her. I find her on the balcony and try to convince her not to jump. I tell her how beautiful she is, though she's tired of hearing that and maybe that's what got her into this mess. I point to the amazing wardrobe in the closet and drawers full of magnificent underthings. Why would you want to give this up, I plead. 
She looks at me funny, though I have bought some time. I try to tell her how lucky she is to be in her body. I try to uh, and praise her proportions and curves, her beautiful hair and smooth skin, the magnificent flatness of her crotch. What kind of a sicko are you, she says, throwing a second leg over the balcony rail. Now get the fuck out of here so I can kill myself in peace. She was sitting on the steps outside an office building on West 50th Street, her head buried in what looked to be a tour book. I was sitting a few steps above her and to the right, shirtless on a hot day, drinking a carton of orange juice after a dance class. She was circling some things with a pen and kept retucking her long dark hair behind her ears. Do you need directions? I asked. No, thanks, she said. I live here. Sorry, I thought you were looking at a map. It's TV Guide. I'm picking out movies to record. She showed me some of the listings she'd circled. Westerns, horror flicks, documentaries. She was tall and quite good looking. She wore a white t-shirt, jeans, and expensive loafers. Her eyes were ringed raccoon-like in black liner, though she wasn't goth. How often do you record movies? Oh, it's what I do. But lately my VCR is giving me trouble. I'm Doug, I said. Zorja, she said, and offered her hand. She asked if I knew how to program a VCR. I told her I could give it a try. She lived alone in a nearby high rise. Her apartment was spacious and mostly empty. There was a TV, several stacks of unlabeled video cassettes, new leather couches. The kitchen gleamed with expensive appliances and three big bowls of fruit. It was like an apartment in a furniture store, though the fruit was real. She said she was on a quest to become a fruitarian, to live on nothing but fruit, and showed me a how-to book by a fruitarian she idolized. She was from California, just out of college where she'd been a competitive swimmer. She was now a kept woman. Her rent and living expenses were being paid by a Japanese executive who visited a few times a year. I didn't ask how the arrangement had come to be. You wanna see something, she said. She led me into one of the bedrooms and opened the double doors to a closet stocked with expensive skirts, blazers, and monochrome dresses, a few of them in dry cleaning bags. Neatly arranged on the floor below were many pairs of expensive shoes, slides, slingbacks, and square-toed pumps with unusual blocky heels. I only wear this stuff when he's in town, she said. He needs me to accompany him to corporate functions. For all her strangeness, she seemed honorable, with no discernible agenda or goals outside of taping movies and becoming a fruitarian. She was also, in a way, living a cross-dresser's dream. Uh, the closets, the beautiful clothes, the furtive life of a kept woman, all of which inspired me to come out to her. I told her that if it were me, I would be wearing those clothes every day, whereupon she became the curious one and started asking questions. She squinted and looked at me again, saying it was hard for her to picture me as a woman. Where do you go? She asked. Different places. One of them you could walk to from here. Can you take me? That Saturday, I stuffed clothes, makeup, shoes, and a wig into, uh, in the black canvas bag I used for school and took the subway to Zorge's apartment. Yo, Getch, said a teenage boy on the platform at Union Square, where I was transferring. Hey, Carlos, I said, giving him a fist bump. Carlos was the quarterback of the Stuyvesant football team. I'd choreographed him in the school musical Hello, Dolly, the year before. He didn't want to do it, but he owed Senor Diaz, his Spanish teacher, who was in charge of costumes, a favor. He and his offensive line agreed to be our dancing waiters, 
on one condition. Carlos had veto rights on all choreography in case a step I gave them was too faggy. Now here, here we were, two dudes out on a Saturday night headed to wherever we were headed. The longer we spoke, the more I feared some telltale feminine garment was protruding from my bag, but I didn't dare look down to check. Would this fit you, Zorja said. She held up a little white dress with red polka dots and fluted skirt. Wow, I could fit into it, but there were cutouts in the bodice and I didn't have the right bra. I also had to shave more of my chest hair. Zorja gave me a nude half cup French lace underwire bra. It was snug, but it worked. I filled the cups with my homemade breast forms, bird seed poured into the cutoff feet of nylons, then knotted up. Striding down 8th Avenue, decked out beside Zorja, felt like the culmination of a lifelong vision, one that had its origin in an episode of the cheesy 1970s TV detective show Vegas. In the episode, three glamorous women conspire to rob a casino, resulting in a showdown on the airport tarmac. The lady criminals are strutting three abreast toward their getaway plane when Detective Dan Tana pulls up in his red sports car and shouts, stop. The, women, the woman in the middle tells the other two to keep walking, then turns to fend off Tana with an impressive series of martial arts kicks. But when her wig comes off, someone shouts, a man, and Tana pummels the crap out of her or him. But I always came back to those three women, sashaying toward the jet that would whisk them safely to Mexico. It was, for me, a vision of heaven. I contemplated it from every angle, including the experience of the actors themselves. How did the two female actresses relate to their cross-dressing colleague? Were they warm toward him or coldly polite? Did they share the same dressing room? And what about his experience? Was this just another job? Or was he thrilled to be a tall, pretty woman walking beside his gorgeous partners in crime as I was? walking with Zorja, the two of us in heels and party dresses turning heads on 8th Avenue. As soon as we entered the fabric factory, all the cross-dressers were checking out Zorja. She became engrossed in a conversation with a tall young cross-dresser I'd never seen before or since. She, I almost wanna say he, wore a dollar store rainbow tube dress and high top basketball sneakers. She hadn't bothered to shave her legs and her makeup was atrocious. She looked like a frat boy who'd lost a bet or else someone out to satirize us. The whole time, the two of them were oblivious to everything else in that bar. It was as though Zorja had switched from me to another TV channel. I saw them exchange numbers. There goes that, I thought. At least I knew I'd be walking out with her, if only to give back her dress. When we got back to her apartment, she immediately kicked off her shoes and changed into sweatpants and a t-shirt. She was completely indifferent toward me, though not unkind. She welcomed me to sleep in the guest room, which I did, alone. I called her the next week, but she didn't return my message and I never saw her again. Was I insane for wanting to date a kept woman who spent her days pirating movies and aspiring to an all fruit diet? Probably, but I was starved for intimacy. And what were the odds of finding a woman, a beautiful one at that, who was okay with my dressing? Zorja had loaned me a dress and stepped out into the night with me and maybe, just maybe, we were each defective enough to belong together. A classic transvestite meets fruitarian love story. <laughs> Alas, no. Thank you.